I, I'm, I'm going to echo something that uh, Rabbi Scott just said, which is that Naomi's book for me also in about the year 2000 when I first picked it up was a revelation um, and really helped to frame ideas around this conference. This conference was started in 2004-ish, um, and Naomi's book was really uh, present in my mind at that, at that time. Um, and also, just on a personal note, I, I want to thank you publicly for being so helpful to me in my own work, in my own writing over all these years. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Naomi Jackson. Uh, her talk is Moving Beyond Walls, The Wise Resonance for Modern Jewish Artists. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. I'd like to start by echoing the words of Anne Sokolov, who almost 30 years ago at an event similar to this said, it's a big honor for me to be here and always in this atmosphere. I'm very touched and very moved and realize how important it is for all of us to know who we are. <coughs> this talk considers why and how the Y functions as an ideological home for many Jews engaged in the arts and ideas in the 20th and 21st centuries. Is this good volume? Okay. As a Jew born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, I never experienced firsthand the Y's riches. But during the writing of my dissertation over 20 years ago, which later became my book on the history of modern dance at the Y, I uncovered a crystallization of values and practices that I profoundly shared. In the following talk, I aim to excavate why this is the case. Specifically, I look at the year 1949, when my parents first fell in love and the Y was celebrating its 75th anniversary as a lens through which to examine the specific configuration of ideas around Jewishness, the arts, and modernism. During April to July 1949, my poet and sculptor mother, originally from Detroit, Michigan, and my architect father from London, England, exchanged lengthy correspondence filled with their philosophies regarding the place of the arts in contemporary society. Using their intense debates as a framework, I will attempt to illuminate, scrutinize, and commemorate the wise artistic and intellectual heritage that continues to radiate beyond its physical walls. In so doing, my hope is to tell a story about the nature of travel and migration, with the Y as a critical hive of activity connecting Jews in the diaspora through a public, communal, and institutional definition of Jewishness outside of traditional, or at least on, alongside uh, traditional religious structures. In terms of Jewish communities, Halifax, Nova Scotia, might be considered one of the most outlying outposts of the diaspora. <laughs> a city of around 350,000, Halifax has a population of about 15 Jews, or 0.004%, and just two synagogues, one Orthodox and cons one Conservative, who often fight with each other. My father and I used to joke that Halifax was to the Jews like some distant primitive village to missionary Christians. It seemed like every few years a, rush, a fresh young rabbi was sent by Israel to lead the Orthodox congregation as a kind of rite of passage from which he would then gain a real posting back in Israel or in Europe or in the United States. When I was growing up, frozen bagels were flown in from Montreal. And once every few years around Passover, someone with payoffs, beard, and black hat and coat would uncannily materialize like an enchanted pixie at our doorstep, selling burnt box, um, boxes of burnt, terrible tasting matzah. There were no reform, no reconstruction, or no Jewish renewal congregations. This meant, among other things, that there were and are very limited choices for living a Jewish life. And when you die in Halifax, something our family painfully learned with the passing of our parents during the last two decades, and you want to be buried as a Jew, if you aren't already a member, your family has to join one of the two congregations because they have control over the Jewish cemeteries. And then, yes, you have to pay thousands of dollars in back dues. I think we, our family paid about $18,000 in back dues. 
This latter observation of the problem of Jewish burial in Halifax is mentioned neither as a random nor morbid point, nor a plea for sympathy for my growing up in a backwater Jewish culture. <laughs> Rather, it points to the urgent question of Jewish identity that is found at the root of modern Jewish artistic life. As my brilliant colleague Marian Kant has argued, with the Enlightenment in Haskalah that was just mentioned, Jews in Europe and consequently in America and Canada became increasingly free to identify themselves in a range of new ways outside of the traditional geographic and religious boundaries of Judaism. On the one hand, this opened the way for Jews to enter the arts professions hitherto close to them, such as, for example, in the realm of classical music, and allowed many to also choose a newly secular approach to their heritage. Kant notes, it was only as late as 1876 that a, a bill was accepted into law in Prussia, allowing Jews to remain Jewish without belonging to a synagogue. On the other hand, new conceptions of selfhood and citizenship established an often conflicted division between a private and public self, self between a private self that could seemingly choose whatever characteristics it wishes and a public self consistently being constricted by restrictive communal definitions arising from external entities, including religious structures, the nation state, political parties, or other kinds of institutional <coughs> conditions. The significance of these shifting and broadening conceptions of Jewishness is that it meant for my parents in the context of Halifax, the only communally sanctioned definitions were along religious lines. There were no organizations where one could be publicly Jewish other than ways delineated by the particular dictates of either the Orthodox or conservative congregations. This was and is very different than a place like New York, a major hub of the Jewish diaspora outside of Israel, and more specifically, for the sake of this talk, when, with an institution like the 92nd Street Y. At the Y, as I argue in my book, Jewishness was to be primarily defined by association, constituency, and patronage, rather than by a list of essentializing criteria specific to Jews according to any single religious doctrine. Playing basketball at the Y with other Jews is what made it Jewish. Just as attending a concert of classical music with other Jews made that Jewish. It was this approach at the Y, which, as I will demonstrate, demonstrate, liberated modern Jews to enjoy the best of non-sectarian cultural programming, especially of modern art forms with similar values. At the Y, there was an opportunity to choose to be secular and an artist and retain a strong public Jewish identity. Indeed, at the Y, for many second and third generation Jews, expressing one's Jewishness through the so-called general contemporary arts became the acceptable and preferred way of being Jewish in America. In contrast, my parents had to find another solution to the ways in which to express and embody their views. They achieved this by cultivating a particular approach to parenting and community engagement that in many ways paralleled what has taken place for decades at the Y. In the next section, I turn to look more closely at the shared values and practices visible at the Y and at the roots of my own heritage that interweave Jewishness, the arts, and modernism in this very particular and I consider magical way. An overview of the Y's arts program from 1949 reveals approximately 165 different events featuring music, theater, dance, and poetry. Music was represented by concerts featuring, among others, the Budapest String Quartet and violinist Isaac Stern. Opera is represented by productions of Hansel and Gretel by the Matinee Opera Company. There was a theatrical production of Rubble Stiltskin by the Y Playhouse. Dance featured lectures on ballet and modern dance by the critic Walter Terry and performances by Valerie Bettis, Jane Dudley, Sophie Madlow, and Virginia Johnson, among others. The Poetry Center, which started in 1949, had readings by William Carlos Williams and E.E. E. Cummings and the writer Truman Capote. 
as the Y's in-house publication, the Y Bulletin heralded, heralded, this didn't even include, the more than 250 classes in art, dance, drama, music, poetry, and literature that were offered that year. So what was the rationale for such an expansive inclusion of the different arts at a Jewish recreational institution? The 92nd Street Y's extensive arts program grew from a vision that the arts, music, poetry, dance, theater, and visual arts give profound meaning to humanity's existence in the modern age. This was the key argument of William Kolodny, who oversaw the arts and educational programming from 1935 to 1969, as he was just mentioned and was responsible for its flourishing. Kaladni argued that the modern period was characterized by skepticism and stress, both of which find relief in full engagement of the self in an activity. The period of the late 40s and early 50s was a time when he fully rationalized this approach. He asserted that the arts provide nourishment to the inner life of an individual in a contemporary world largely devoid of myth and religion when he argued in his 1950 dissertation, even if there are no scientific or moral sort of certitudes as there seem to have been in the previous age, the hunger for beauty and for truth is enduring. It is in this area that adult education can meet most effectively the need of every individual to live in a world of his own making. In terms of the tensions of modern life of requiring alleviated, Kaladni claimed that industrialization has forced man to specialize and involve only a limited part of his being. Freedom from tension is possible only by immersing the, quote, whole personality in an activity. He stressed, true re relaxation can come only from the absorption, the most intense absorption in one or more activities such as art, music, drama, or poetry, since interest on this level involves the total personality over a long period of time. For Kaladi, the arts programming wherever was an organic outgrowth and understandable modern response linked to a Jewish historical tradition of learning. He observed a small but significant part of the second and third generation of Jews in this country that formed the nucleus of the Jewish intellectual leadership have transferred their interest from knowledge of a religious nature to knowledge of general interest, particularly in the abstract fields such as the liberal arts. And elsewhere, he argued that there were a significant number of Jewish youth whose, quote, Chief means of recreation was in the field of the fine arts and in education generally. For Kaladi, therefore, it was important that the Y provide a range of general or non-sectarian arts events that would fulfill this dimension of modern American Jews. Although we will return to the question of general versus specifically Jewish programming later, my point here is to emphasize Kaladi's defense of general arts programming as a key component of a contemporary Jewish identity rooted in, but separate from, a religious tradition. Poetry, for Kaladi, was a key example of just this kind of continuity. He observed that poetry, more than any other art, can be a substitute for prayer. The Poetry Center, he wrote, was started to meet the needs of the very few persons in New York to whom poetry offers the theological, the ethical, and the aesthetic equivalents of traditional religion. And he commented in 1950, somewhat wryly, on, uh, that on the mood, that the mood at public readings at the Y, which were to become a landmark in the American poetry scene, quote, is almost religious in its reverence. This is true even when the poet doesn't read well. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 1949, as evidenced in the correspondence between my then 25-year-old mother and 23-year-old father. My parents were prime examples of young Jews passionately committed to fine arts and education as a means of leading a fuller existence. Although in their case, not in their leisure time, but as their central vocations. 
I show here the stack of letters my parents wrote to each other for four months between April and July 1949, as they got to know each other after having spent a brief one week together in London. During this brief time apart, my mother explored life as a young sculptor and stayed with relatives in Paris, while my father finished up his architecture studies at the Polytechnic in London. Uh, and these come out to about 100 pages, single-spaced, <laughs> of text. In her letters, my mother, then Jeanette Sherman, writes of listening to records of Shostakovich and Mar Mozart, records that she had brought with her all the way from the United States to Britain and then to France. She discusses reading the poetry of W.H. Auden and T.S. Eliot, and multiple art magazines, many of which she borrowed in Paris from the English Council Library. She also attended the opera and various dance and ballet performance performances. Here in this postcard from June 25th, she reports, I walked 12 kilometers and visited expositions of Kandinsky's, Matisse, Picasso, and Degas works. Impressions were wonderful. I learned so much. My father, in his letters, meanwhile, mentions visiting house by Walter Gropius and comments at length on the work of architects like the Hungarian-born modernist Bauhaus designer Marcel Breuer. What is also evident in their letters is that they represent exactly the kinds of young second-generation Jews that Claudia is speaking about. Both had turned away from traditional religious identifications with Judaism, as well as group customs, were committed to being part of contemporary life and were fiercely independent in their opinions. For my father, who had, I should mention, served in the immediate post-war period in India as part of the British withdrawal from colonial rule, these views were evident in his rejection of all forms of fanaticism, his constant expressions of skepticism and statement that there are no morals but those made by man. He was also extremely critical of Jewish family members who blamed all of their pro problems on anti-Semitism and expressed his frustration and anger with a cousin who he believed had blind faith in Palestine. For my mother, she observes, quote, my intuitions have, gotten, have always gotten me into difficulties with the group ways. She describes how she can, is continually shocking her bourgeois relatives by how she dresses, for instance, in old riding pants to sculpture in, and writes, quote, I feel young and strong, wanting to see and encompass learning. More spiritual in orientation than my father, though no less against institutionalized religion, she also more consistently articulated the role of the arts and education in a manner similar to Kaladni as directly related to spiritual uplift and individual fulfillment. She asserts, quote, with the secular should not be lost the human and emotion, end of quote, end quote. My awareness to what I call soul began when I learned expression with poetry of this joy and gratitude for life was expanded at college very early. Beliefs in excellence, the integration of the arts with each other, and in making the arts accessible to normal people in everyday life were another trio of intertwined perspectives visible in both my parents' outlooks and in the philosophy of arts programming at the Y. In Paris, my mother befriended Henri Pierre Rocher, the famous author of Jules and Jim, who was deeply involved in the avant-garde and arranged for her to exhibit at the Gallery Apollinaire in Paris. She writes, I've met with Monsieur Rocher, art collector and writer, 70 years old. He introduced Gertrude Stein, her brother, to Picasso. I learned from observation and talk with others. And elsewhere she states, talking with Diego Rivera and Jose Orozco, whom she had met in Mexico, and others gives me knowledge that I don't get usually. They help me see, and what I feel observe also adds to my understanding. These words directly illustrate a point argued early on by Kaladni of the need to have a quality versus mediocre or low-level arts programming at the Y, and exposure to the very best artists in each field. 
You wrote as early as 1936, a quality program is the only kind of program that will bring to us those Jewish young men and women who seek recreation through education and the fine arts. The general attitude towards the entire program is that it must sink or swim on the basis of authenticity of content, method, scholarship, and learning. There will be no retreat to superficiality that characterize adult education in this country. A simultaneous emphasis on integrating the arts in everyday life and making them accessible to ordinary people to interpret and make their own individual meaning is a democratic perspective towards the creation and reception of the arts. It is also evident in my parents' views. My mother proclaims the importance of integrating sculpture with living cannot be overemphasized. The integration of the arts and our art with life is natural. And my father explains, let you and I lead the campaign to give art to the people so that they understand the need for delighting the senses. Perhaps one of the best examples of how committed my parents were to this outlook was their later participation in the famous This Is Tomorrow exhibition at Whitehall Art Gallery in 1956. For this, they collaborated with the Italian painter Emilio Scannavino to create an integrated installation of sculpture, architecture, and painting. One part of their manifesto for the catalog stated, we do not care for middlemen. Democracy becomes cultured. The critic grows obsolete. We must welcome the public into our studios. Here are some photographs of the installation where you can see my mother's sculptures emerging from the wall. And the sculptures, uh, I mean the paintings of Scannavino on the vertical panels. And that's my mother. Here you see um, my father in this photograph who oversaw the design of the installation. Uh, and also on the wall, you'll see some of what he designed as sort of an abstract um, panel with, uh, with nails and different um, uh, materials. That William Kolodny also shared this democratic commitment to educating and cultivating the ordinary person's appreciation of the arts is perhaps most clearly demonstrated in his insistence that while high caliber, classes were rarely to exclusively focus on aspiring professionals. Rather, he believed that through the direct experience of making their own art, a continued exposure to history and theory as a means to contextualize his or her practice and contact with high quality role models in the different art forms, a lay person could become a, a true connoisseur. That this kind of multi-pronged approach to arts programming was ultimately successful is widely recognized by the renown of the wise audiences for the discerning taste. A reviewer of a dance recital in 1941 observed, it was an audience equipped with the necessary knowledge of technique familiar with the interpretive method, and thus able to analyze and discuss the performance intelligibly and intelligently. For my parents, it is important to further recognize that this ebb and flow between making and reflecting, doing and thinking, was very much geared towards a modernist agenda. My mother passionately wrote, Yet today, young artists, myself and you, must analyze when not creating so that they can find a vocabulary new to express their philosophy. My parents' engagement with the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London in the early 50s, constant lecturing about the arts, my mother lectured at the Tate Gallery, for instance, and even hosting a radio show in close, relation, uh, close friendship with the art historian Meyer Shapiro, who was also an influential force of the Y, are all in testaments to this commitment to theorizing a meaningful role for art in contemporary life. And it is something that is consistently demonstrated in the Y's program, where again, using 1949 as a lens, 
There was a dominant focus in, on understanding contemporary art through such lectures as contemporary dramatic literature to understanding modern art. And this hardly begins to describe the range of ongoing classes that also had a, a modern focus, such as a course in production of creative cinema uh, taught by Maya Darren. Indeed, for Kalodny, this value of making art in a cyclical relation with intellectual reflection was a clear example of extending and transforming a deep-seated tradition of Jewish study and debate, but within a contemporary context. In an article on the Y from 1956, the author reports that Kolodny as observe, uh, reports Kolodny as observing that learning and intellectual discussion in themselves are part of a Jewish tradition. He offered the example of a typical poetry class conducted by a friar, a former director of the Poetry Center. The class would meet at 8.40 in the evening carry on a heated discussion with about T.S. Eliot, Gertrude Stein, and kindred subjects until the Y closed at 11.30, and then adjourn to a nearby restaurant where the convent conversation usually ended about one in the morning. This sort of activity, said Dr. Kolodny, is typically Jewish, even though Mr. Fryer and the restaurants were both Greek. Speaking of Greek restaurants, another shared value, although perhaps one of the most hotly contested both at the Y and between my parents, was a respect for peoples and traditions of other cultures and belief that greater understanding and engagement with these are important. I love the rabbi's reaching, stretching gesture. <laughs> In terms of Kolodny, this can be seen in his ongoing attempts to, attempts to make the arts program as non-sectarian as possible within a Jewish center framework through hiring, attendance policies, and programming choices. For instance, as early as 1935, he declared that admission is on a non-sectarian basis. And he began hiring non-Jewish experts to teach and direct the various arts programming. Looking at 1949 as our case study, one sees that Doris Humphrey was the director of the Dance Center, an appointment to a position to which she was appointed in 1945, and the American poet and literary critic John Malcolm Brennan was the newly appointed director of the Poetry Center, both non-Jewish. In terms of a cross-cultural reach, events that years included, year included dances and ceremonies of the American Indian and an East-West series including Americans and India, New Opportunity, and the Dances of India, and so on. At the Y, these non-sectarian moves often challenged the real limits of a Jewish institutional frame and led to Kolodny needing to continually justify his inclusive perspective to the Y's board, which he Riley uh, refers to as as causing him a lot of stress, even though he was trying to get rid of it with through his arts programming. <laughs> One of his main arguments in this regard was that, quote, human needs are non-sectarian and that humans cannot, beings cannot be departmentalized. He argued, quote, that young people come to any institution, including a sectarian institution, institution primarily as human beings with total human needs. The arts, he said, are part of those needs since they speak to the fundamental nature of the human being and express deeply felt concerns. As such, participation in the arts cuts across people's differences, providing a language of communication that unites people of various religious and ethnic backgrounds. To this extent, he asserted, the arts should be accessible to everyone, even in a Jewish institution. For my parents, who had little interest in being part of any organized religious or Jewish community, there was never any question about the need for the arts to be completely accessible. As mentioned above, both fervently believed in art for the people and not confined to galleries, and throughout their lives, they welcomed people from different backgrounds into their lives without bias. In 1949, however, a major conflict surfaced in their correspondence correspondence over the notion of internationalism and the extent to which one needed to physically travel in order to benefit from interaction with other peoples and cultures 
to develop and enrich one's art and lives. Both had close friendships with people from India, for instance, but my mother believed it important to go to Bombay if possible. As she wrote of traveling in general, my physical displacement stimulates perception. My father, on the other hand, argued, I believe that one can travel to one's heart's content and still become no broader in outlook. I've seen it in the army. My eldest brother went to Palestine, Egypt, Libya, Italy, Germany, Belgium, and within the Russian zone of Germany for a bit, and still thinks that God sent the white man to rule the world. Actually, that paragraph ends, and he even thinks so more now, <laughs> something to that effect. Their lengthy debate over travel or migration reveals fascinating tensions over modernist ideas regarding the arts and the extent to which innovation and meaning have either one, a universal, international, abstract dimension as refracted through an, the vision of an individual artist, or two, are highly contextual and local in responses to particular problems by artists who themselves are shaped by their environment. My mother's statements represent, actually she, this was the way she was her whole life, represent the former kinds of universalist discourse expressed by Kalani, and I should note by many of the modern dancers who found why such a haven in the 1940s and 50s. She asserted, I'm today interested in the problems of content and art, meaning, interpretation of universals into communicative symbols, and she often talks in this sort of universal type of language. For her, an enthusiastic openness to other cultures in this context was a, a necessary ingredient for inspiration, for experimenting with new materials and imagery, but she remained a firm believer in art as a universal language of communication, created it though out of the uniquely subjective vision of the artist, for humans who share an underlying essence in relation to each other and nature. My father, on the other hand, fiercely attacked this position, I would even say viciously at times in their correspondence, as a form of naive American optimism and even a kind of American cultural imperialism that failed to take into consideration the deep effects of, an, of environment on art and artists alike. And in so doing, he believed she also missed the ability to value certain developments in modern art, especially those happening in Europe. For instance, he writes about his pride in being part of a new nationalist movement in modern English architecture that is responding to particular problems found in the UK. United Kingdom and asserts, I wish to travel but merely, as, but merely as a means to an end, and the end is building English buildings for Englishmen, not machines for unspecified robots. Architecture is for people, and people, no matter what you say, vary according to their environment. In another letter, he observes, could it be that you, in your international dreamland, have overlooked the fact that art owes something to local environment? Interestingly, both ultimately respected each other's positions, recognizing the topic to be a very complex one. Here's an example of his handwriting, which is incredibly neat. <laughs> and his, this is, again, they were at 23 arguing about this. He, he states, actually the argument is that a craftsman can design anywhere, that the American car designer is equally at home in Britain, that the Chinese architect can, knowing the problems, design buildings in art America, that Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings in Japan are Japanese. I can't help thinking that conception of internationalism disregards what we know of evolution and tends to think in terms of static situations. Yet I am assailed by doubts. Did Gropius build German in Germany, English in England, American in America? It's very difficult to answer. So you see, you've absolutely upset my peace of mind. <laughs> and I love the way he says at the end of this particular letter, I find it a little terrifying that one person should hold such power over another. Good night, dearest. <laughs> so despite the vicious attacks, there's still love. 
1994, when I interviewed Carl Urban, a longtime executive of the Y, he observed, and this is again referencing what the rabbi mentions, Kalani was a unique man. There are relatively few people in the community who have the knowledge and the interest and commitment that Kalani had both to the universal as well as the Jewish as sources of human enrichment. Indeed, it was Kalani's sincere belief that within a pluralistic democracy, this process of integration could be achieved with joy and reciprocal benefit. If for my American-born mother and British father, there evolved a mutual respect for each other's positions, for Kalani, this consistent message was that non-Jewish and Jewish creativity could be synthesized to improve everyone's experience. Digging more deeply into this idea of universalism and particularism, particularism, it is evident that the predominant arts discourse around modernism allowed for Jews like my parents and those at the Y who follow Kalani's lead to participate in a complex process of assimilation. That discourse, as represented especially by my mother's statements, asserted that an individual could transcend his or her particular circumstances to create work of universal significance. On the one hand, this made room for minorities, such as Jews, to join the elite, predominantly waspy art world of the time. In this process, participating in the contemporary art world was clearly a means of displaying upward mobility and acceptance into middle class and upper class white life. Indeed, during their lifetimes, my parents radically transformed from poor working class origins to part of the upper middle class, which I then benefited. And I would also say um, this is a, obviously a time of whitening and anglicizing. I went, my family name was changed during my father's time from Tzalelahin to Jackson. At the same time, these young Jews were clearly passionately engaged in redefining these entities even as they joined them. Theirs was an active reshaping of art and society in line with long-held progressive and humanistic views, especially those of social justice, focused on diversity, inclusion, and equity. In terms of the why, my familiarity with the history of modern dance there allows me to use it as an example, excellent example of this. On the one hand, Kaladni reached out to the central creators and propagators of modern dance, such as John Martin, Louis Horst, and Doris Humphrey. On the other, he sponsored young performers, European-trained dancers, dancers of different ethnic origins, especially African-American, such as Alvin Ailey, who got his major break as a choreographer here. Uh, many of you know that Revelations was per first performed here and Jewish. The result was a challenge to the narrowly formalist definition of modern dance frequently advanced by the more established wing of the dance community, an embracing of diversity of ethnicity, race, age, experience, and stylistic experimentation that greatly expanded the field. Looking at 1949, for instance, Chinese dancer Lin Pei Fen and Japanese American dancer Yuriko featured modern work with Asian influences. African American dancers Janet Collins and Ronnie Owl were among the winners that year of the unique audition winners concerts, an annual highlight that featured young up and coming talented performers. And Katja Delacove and Fred Burke performed Jewish inflected modern dance. As many of you know, Burke was a major force at the Y, especially in terms of popularizing Israeli folk dancing, an activity that we know continues to thrive at the Y today. Indeed, it is important to understand that Kaladi valued, greatly valued, Jewish artists and specifically Jewish content. But they vary greatly depending on the di directorship of the individual art program as well as the time period. For instance, the Poetry Center, overseen for many years by non-Jewish directors, appears to have had the least clearly sectarian programming, programming, with exceptions like the remarkable Yiddish Hebrew poetry series from 1963 to 1969. The music area, which was overseen by an important composer, 
of Jewish liturgical music, Abraham Binder from 1917 to 1966, on the other hand, featured many classical music concerts featuring prominent Jewish musicians, as well as recitals of contemporary Jewish music performed by the Wise Own Choral Society, and in the 1980s oversaw a contemporary Jewish opera project under his daughter Hadassah Markson's leadership. And I should also mention that an Anglo-Jewish theater was first attempted in the mid-30s, and then again, a contemporary American Jewish theater was formed in the 1980s and performed. Visual art, for its part, also oversaw many exhibitions on Jewish and Israeli art and culture over the years. However, the strong influence of the social realist artist Aaron Berkman, initially, as we heard the other day, overseeing the WPA program at the Y, from the mid-1930s through to 1967, meant that the main focus of the arts programming was on individual expression and in um, relations with modernism rather than allegiance to any particular culture or aesthetic. Bergman described his philosophy in 1956 by saying, quote, over and above everything else, we respect the individual characteristics of each student and try to develop his or her creative activity capacities to the utmost. Later from 1966 to 1991, the innovative program Red, Yellow, Blue, and Glue dramatically invigorated the children's arts program and was just this perspective. Here, young kids followed their individual creative paths by dancing together and painting directly on a huge tarpaulin spread across the floor. Parents still rave about this today and the freedom of expression and sense of community fostered by this class. At the end of August 1949, my father and mother were married in London. So they met in April for a week, parted, wrote these letters, traveled together illicitly, supposedly, right, uh, for in Europe for about six weeks, and then came back and got married within two weeks. And they began their lives together, respectively, as a young architect and sculptor. This is my mother. She sculptured, and my father taught and designed exhibitions. So this is a, one of my, my, my mother with some of her early hanging sculptures. She worked with a uh, plaster, and this is one of her early sculptures in the early 50s in England. My father uh, taught, designed exhibitions, as well as he, he worked for the Festival of Britain. Um, in the early 50s, and also designed and built a house for his parents in Brighton. That's the exterior from the back, and this is the interior where they, you can see my mother's sculptures, and they also had paintings in there by, by Scanavino, and that's my mother with their dog, Tammy, <laughs> and um, my father's taking the photograph. My father, uh, my mother, um, also, when she came, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll come back. In 1956, they immigrated to Canada. My brother was born in 1958 in Ottawa. He's now a music professor, and I came along in Halifax in 1964 as a dancer and choreographer and scholar. When possible, my mother created work for public spaces. Here's her sculpture that she did many dancers um, before I was born. This is at Cloverdale Mall in Toronto. And she collaborated with dancers and filmmakers and ran arts festivals for the community. She was a founder of the first artist cooperative in Halifax and was a pioneer in copier art, mail art, and computer art, engaging new technologies to make art accessible to the broader community. My father wrote books on low-cost housing and promoted buildings democratically designed in collaboration with their inhabitants. My brother and I grew up in an atmosphere of constant creativity and critique. Here's my brother writing one of my mother's sculptures. <laughs> and here we are offering a puppet show 
the stories written by my father and puppets made by, by, by my mother, and we often perform these at, local li at the local library. So that's me. <laughs> in Halifax, my parents were an island unto themselves, as you can imagine. A miniature flashpoint of artistic and intellectual rigor, joy, love, tolerance, and acceptance. Without an institution like the 92nd Street Y, they were not able to find fruitful connections with most of the other Jews in their city. These Jews generally held more conservative and materialistic views, and my parents' own continued ambivalence towards Judaism and Israel, anti-capitalist sensibility, and fierce sense of independence also made for an uneasy fit. Unlike at the Y, and this is an important difference, there was no conscious attempt by my parents to focus on Jewish subject matter or promote Jewish causes in any marked manner. This ink wash drawing by my mother, for instance, is one of the only works that she ever made with a clearly Jewish subject. Similarly, our home, was le our home life was mostly devoid of behaviors, customs, or artifacts related to Jewish religion or tradition. So where does that leave us? In a letter from 1949, my mother makes the intriguing observation when describing her childhood. After a while, I became Jewish, or no, after a while, I became a Jew. What an interesting statement. After a while, I became a Jew. I believe that she partly meant that her experience of her Jewishness came from external rather than internal forces, that in Marion Kant's analysis, it was imposed on her because in her Detroit, poor working class landscape of her youth, she found herself distinguished from the Italian, German, Irish, English, and then Polish and African Americans around her. After all, she once said she was called Christ killer by her other children. At the same time, her inner awareness of herself is different and unfaltering drives throughout her life to follow her artistic vision, speak to her strong sense of inner self as a Jew. She and my father found and then decided to marry each other as modern secular Jewish artists and so chose association as the main way in which to define their Jewishness. In that sense, then, they were exactly like the why, albeit on a small scale, and a testimony, I believe, to the power of the Jewish creative spirit in the modern age. Today, the fact that I am here, honoring both my parents and the why's creative legacies, is a sign of the continuation of this powerful artistic and intellectual tradition of Jewishness into the 21st century. For this, I am greatly, greatly, and profoundly grateful, and hope that you join me in feeling incredibly thankful that we are all here participating and collaborating in this Jewish movement that lives within and extends far beyond these surrounding walls. Thank you to Doug Rosenberg for inviting me to do this keynote, to the support of Bernard Schwartz and having the courage, for giving me the courage to speak from a personal place, which I never do, <laughs> to my dear fellow dance artists here today and to all of you for listening. As we are all well aware, it takes Mushbucha to succeed, and that sense of family exists at the Khan Conference. Thank you.